picking up here in 2 Samuel, the second chapter. Verse 1, And it came to pass after this, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. Because remember, David was staying with the Philistines while the whole Saul situation uh, you know, handled itself, essentially. So God told him to go up to Hebron. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, I know him the Jezreelites, and Abigail Nabal's wife the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron, right? Hebron and the suburbs of Hebron. And you know we like the maps on this, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the uh, the map that we generally use. It's got the most cities on it, just to show where Hebron is. All right, uh, as you see down here, there's Hebron, right there in Judah, and we'll get right back to it. And the men of Judah came. And there they anointed David king over the house of Judah, right? So at that point, it was just uh, David being the king of the Judite tribe. They were the only ones who anointed him, all right? And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul, right? So they, they let him know that situation, that the Gadites were the one who come and buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him, right? So, um, David sent the, the good messages to them, saying, Thank you, essentially, right? You've done a good thing. And of course, here is Jabesh Gilead. So, let's get back. And now, this is verse 6, And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you and I also will requite the, you this kindness because ye have done this thing therefore now let your hands be strengthened and be ye valiant for your master Saul is dead and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them right so he told the men of Jabesh Gilead first right he knew that they were loyal to Saul he said look here's the situation now I'm, I'm the king now I've been anointed uh, verse 8 but Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. Now, Mahanaim, I believe, is across the Jordan, also within Gad. Yes, Mahanaim, I'm about to scroll down so you can see it, right here, along the Jabbok. Not too far from Jabesh Gilead, but a bit south and east of it. All right, so Abner, the son of Ner, right, who was the, the general or the captain, as the scriptures say, of Saul's army, has anointed Saul's son to be king. And made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel, right? So at this point, David was only made king over Judah. Ishbosheth was made king over everywhere else. Uh, verse 10. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Right? So total. All right? But Ishbosheth has his little two year stint while all this is going on. Verse 12, And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon, right? Gibeon is where um, Saul had his kingdom established, Gibeon being right over here in Benjamin. I don't know if y'all can see that. Let me zoom in just a little bit. And you can see Gibeon there. In Gibeon, verse 13, And Joab, the son of Zerujah, the servants and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. Uh, verse 14, 
And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And when he say play, he ain't talking about, he ain't talking about a little play date. All right, he's talking about going to war. <laughs> and Joab said, let them arise. Verse 15. Then there arose and went over by a number, 12 of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. All right, because David he, he rolled with the mightiest men. David's army was the mightiest army, even amongst Israel. Verse eighteen. And there were the three sons. Oh, oh, excuse me. And there were three sons of Zerujah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. He was very fast, very quick running. Was Asahel. And Asahel pursued after Abner, and in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Right, he's pursuing him, he's chasing him. Verse 20, then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to the right hand or to the left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. Right, so Abner saying, Look, you don't want to do this go somewhere else. You don't want to follow me. Verse 22. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to joy of thy brother? Right? Because they all used to be on the same side. But now it's a civil war type situation where every man is against his brother. Howbeit he refused to turn him aside. Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many came to the place where Asaph fell down and died, they stood still. Right? So all Abner had to do, because Asaph was on him, right? He's on he's on his tail. All Abner had to do was pull his spear out, let him run through the back end of it. Right? And not even the pointy end. He run through the back end of it. Verse 24. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Ammah that lied before Gaia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? Right? So Abner's like, Look, we just going to war. How long is this war going to take? How many lives is it going to cost? Right? So what, what are we really going to, what are we really going to do then? And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up, every one from following his brother. Right, so Joab said, It didn't even have to be that serious. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still, and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain, and passed over Jordan, and went through all Bithron, and they came to Mahanaim. Right, so they, they went back where uh, they, they weren't trying to set up in uh, Gibeon anymore. They went back across the Jordan. Verse 30. Let me go down here. There we go. And Joab returned from following Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servant 19 men and Asahel. Right, so 20 men in total. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men so that Three hundred and four, three score men died. So that's three hundred and sixty. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at break of day. Right. So we're still in the midst of this uh, civil war type situation. And if you don't know where Bethlehem is, it's just south of Jerusalem, just north of Hebron. 
There it is right there. All right. Let's go back. Chapter 3. And we'll start with verse 1. Now there was, a, there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Meaning, Ishbosheth being the head, but you know, all, all of that troop. All right, verse 2. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Adonam the Jezreelitis, uh, and his second Chiliab of Abigail. Uh, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Malkan, the daughter of Talma, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Hagith, and the fifth, Shef Ataya, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrim, by Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Verse 6 And it came to pass. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. Right? Abner, a very formidable warrior. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aja. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. Right? So, uh, obviously, if a man dies, his wife can then remarry, right? It was like that in the old covenant. It's like that in the new covenant. So Ishbosheth getting pissed about this. That's you know it's lawful, right? What's what's wrong with what Abner's doing? Um. So naturally, Abner's upset that Ishbosheth uh, is taking offense to this. Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with fault concerning this woman? Verse 9. So do God to Abner and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah. From Dan to Beersheba, right? And uh, that expression is a common expression in the scriptures. All right, from Dan to Beersheba, just to give you a hint, or just to give you a reference point. Beersheba is down here, as you see, a very southern city. And Dan is up here in the north, a very northern city. So when they say from Dan to Beersheba, they mean all of Israel. All right? Um, verse 11 and he could not answer Abner a word again because he he feared him right so Abner as we saw in the last chapter he wanted to stop the bloodshed right but he, he was loyal to Saul as the king he said Saul's dead Jonathan's dead we make Ishbosheth the king right so uh, Abner does have that very traditional way of thinking but he loves the people of Israel. He loves the children of Israel. He wants to do what's best by them, right? So, you, you gotta you gotta imagine being in Abner's position here. You're already trying to uh, do this for this man, be kind to this man, and fighting on his behalf. You're losing men left and right, uh, and then he gets pissed at you for marrying an ex-wife of uh, or marrying a widow of, of your father, right? Like that's uh, that's pretty. Uh, insulting. I'll put it like that. So Abner's not having it anymore. He said, that's the last straw. I ain't, I ain't doing this no more. I'm going to uh, um, surrender to King David. And obviously Ishbosheth can't say nothing to him about that. Verse 12. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when thou comes to see my face, right? So remember Michal, she was promised to King David, but Saul gave her to somebody else. So, so David's like, look, you want to make peace with me? Bring me my wife. Verse 14, and David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, deliver me Michal, 
deliver me my wife and call, which I espouse to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Faltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her to Baharim. Then said Abner unto him, Go return, and he returned, right? So he was simping, uh, oh, what, uh, Faltiel. Faltiel was simping, he was crying, oh, moaning, even though he took somebody else's wife. Now they taken his wife back, uh, who was righteously theirs in the first place. Now he's whining about it. Abner said, look, get out of here. We ain't got no time for that weak foolishness. And Abner, verse 17, and Abner, Abner had communication with the elders of Israel saying, you sought for David in time past to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord has spoken to David saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. Right? So Abner's starting to come around. And Abner also spake in the ears of Benjamin. And Abner went also to speak in the ears of David and Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel, and that seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. Right? So he's, he's uh, making all the provisions necessary to, to make peace. All right? Between these warring tribes. All right? Verse 20, so Abner came to David to Hebron and 20 men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a league with thee and that thou mayest reign over all that thy heart desireth. And David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Right, so Abner said, look, I will make sure that all Israel comes to you and anoints you as king. Verse 22, and behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the host that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king and he had sent him away and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, what hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away? And he is quite gone, right? So Joab is bloodthirsty. Joab said, kill him. Just kill him. Why, why didn't you kill him while he was here? Why'd you send him away in peace? Meanwhile, David knows how to deal with this unrighteousness, deal with this wisely, right? Verse 25. Thou knowest, Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. Verse 26. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sarah. But David knew it not. All right, so now Joab's sneaking around doing his own thing. All right. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother, right? So Joab got emotional. He's like, you killed my brother, I'm gonna kill you. I don't give a damn what you're doing. All right, verse 29. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his fathers. Okay, hold on. I skip, I skip verses then. Verse 28. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Like David said, look, I did not want you to do this. I did not tell you to do this. This is not on me. This is on you. Verse 29, let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. And let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue or, or that is a leper or that leaneth on a staff or that falleth on a sword or that lack of bread. So, right? so David is cursing him. He's saying, look, your whole family is going to be jacked up because of this. Because the blood on your hands. Alright? Verse 30. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon. Um, yep. Yeah, at Gibeon in the battle, right? So because they did it out of emotion, they did it out of revenge. Verse 31. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bier. And they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept, right? So they had a real uh, classy funeral for Abner, right? Because that, that was really Abner's intention, was to do what is best for Israel, right? And when he saw Ishbosheth is not going to do that, 
And he said, well, let me bring on Israel to David. He didn't even get a chance to do that before Joab killed him. Verse 33. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him, right? So he didn't even die in the heat of battle, right? He was deceived. And that's how he died, right? Joab may have approached him and said, you know, look, you know, we're at peace now, right? Boom, got it. Verse 35. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swore, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or all else, till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner, son of Ur, the son of Ner. Right? Everyone understood it from that point. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak. Though anointed king, and these men, the sons of Zerusha, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Right? So, he said, look, these sons of Zerusha are some bloody, bloody men. So let's keep going. Uh, this is chapter 4 in 2 Samuel, verse 1. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble. And all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Ba'ana, and the name of the other were Cobb, the sons of uh, Rimen, a uh, uh, Berathite, of the children of Benjamin, for Barath. Uh, also was reckoned in Benjamin, reckoned to Benjamin, and the Barathites fled to Gitam uh, or, or Gitaim, and were sojourners there until this day. Right? All right. So now <laughs> the word got to Ishbosheth that Abner, the son of Ner, is dead. So now he knows he has no chance. He has no hope. Right? Let me make sure all this is still going well. Yeah. Okay. All praise to the Most High. Anyway. Verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass that she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth, right? So he broke his legs whenever he was very young and they never, never healed properly. Uh, verse 5. And the sons of Remen, the Barathite, Rechab and Ba'ana, went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house, as they as though they would have fetched wheat, and they smote him under the fifth rib. All right, so these, these Benjamites come in, kill Ishbosheth. And were common by Anah, his brother escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away through the plain all night right so they cut his head off took his head and they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David to Hebron and said to the king behold the head of Ishbosheth the son of Saul thine enemy which sought thy life and the Lord hath avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed verse 9 and David answered Rechab and Ba'anah, his brother, the sons of Ramon, the Berathite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I, t I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag. Who thought that I would have given him a reward for his, uh, a reward for his tidings? Right. So David is not the man to rejoice over the death of his uh, enemies, right? Because he, he loved Saul. Saul was, he, he viewed Saul as the anointed of the Lord. So he loved all Saul's children as well, especially Jonathan. All right. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed? Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. 
But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulchre of Abner in Hebron. Right? So they buried Ishbosheth in the same place as Abner. Well, his head at least. All right. Let's keep going. Second Samuel chapter five, starting with verse one. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us and brought us in Israel. Led us out and brought us in Israel, right? Going to war. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. So finally we get that moment where all of Israel anoints David as king. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. All right. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah, right? All 12 tribes. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. <laughs> right. So these Jebusites thought there was some. Nope. Nope. And they're called Jebusites because Jerusalem, the Canaanite name for it was Jebus. All right. Uh, verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. That's why they call it the city of David. Because David is the one who took it, named it Jerusalem. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and Edward. Right, Milo being a suburb of Jerusalem. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Verse 11, And Haram king of Tyre sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. Right, so here you see um, Haram king of Tyre, right, a Canaanite king, uh, you know, the Phoenicians and all that. Um, we're we're going to see Haram more when we start getting into Solomon, but... I just wanted to point out that the fame of David went round about to the nations that were uh, surrounding, uh, in the surrounding areas, I should say. All right. Verse 12. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these were the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem. Right, so this would be, uh, he had six sons before this. All right. So it's Shemua and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon. Ibar also, and Elishua and Nepheg and Japhia and Elishama, Eliada and Eliphalet. Verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, the valley of Rephaim, I assume, is the same valley that we talk about every week, as you can see on the map right here. Philistia being the Gaza coast, and of course, as you can see, Judah is all of this that we've been talking about. So I assume this is the valley right here, the Valley of Rephaim, somewhere in that area. There we go. Let's go back. Verse 19, And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. Right. So notice David is always uh, seeking counsel before he goes out to do these things. He's always inquiring of the Lord. Verse 20, And David came to Belperazim, 
And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Bel Perazim. Uh, Lord of breaches, I believe is what that is. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Right, so he's burning the idols, like what the scriptures say to do to him. All right, uh, I don't know if Bel Perazim is going to be on here though. It seems like a smaller area. Uh, yeah, I'm not not seeing Bel Perazim anywhere. No, no, not seeing Bel Perazim. It's probably a smaller smaller town, smaller city. Uh, in that valley. So let's go back. Uh, where did I leave off? Uh, verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord God before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gazer. Right? So he asked God this time, and God said, No, I want, I want to do something special this time. Let's do something different. Come around this way, and then we'll get them from that way, and it will be an even greater defeat of the Philistines. All right? So let's let's go to chapter six, because we, we, we start to see, well, we, we have seen the beginning, the foundation of David's kingdom established. All right. So second Samuel six, we'll start with verse one. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gebeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gebeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark, right? So this whole time, Israel ain't had the ark since we first mentioned it back in 1 Samuel, all right, when it was returned. The people was not messing with it because the ark holds special spiritual powers. All right, you, you can't just touch it. You can't just look into it, right? You will die. It can't just be in an unclean place because it will uh, bring diseases and bring ailments and bring all sorts of natural disasters upon that place. All right, verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fur, made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals, right? All these different musical instruments, they're having a parade. They're having a good time, right? Having a good time. And when they came to Nakan's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the ox and shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God, right? So somebody touched it, wasn't supposed to touch it, dead on the spot. That's the type of spiritual power that is within that ark. Alright? And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. Right? The breach of Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Right? He said, look, we can't even touch it. How are we supposed to move this thing? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. All right? So when, it, when the ark is around righteousness, it starts to bless everything. That's why they want it. So they can use that to establish the kingdom. Right? Because of the spiritual power that the ark holds. Verse 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Right? So he was happy to do it because he knows that, okay, the ark is, is blessing the righteous. We, need, we can go get it now. And it was so 
that when they bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. He said, look, I ain't taking no chances, though. I'm, we're going to sacrifice to the Lord every six steps. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet, right? So David, he, he, he's, he's getting down, you know, he, he's breakdancing, all that kind of stuff. He, he's, again, they're having a great time. Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. All right, we're going to see why here in a minute. Verse 17, and they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel as well, uh, to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flag and a wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house, right? So he, he, he's giving gifts to the people. He's giving uh, food to the people. They're passing out plates, right? They're, have, uh, again, having a great time. He said, look, take the leftovers home with you. They <laughs> had, had a great time bringing the ark um, from Obed-Edom's house, right? Did the same thing that they were doing before, before the uh, breach of Uzzah, right? Verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids and handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shameless, shamelessly uncovered himself. Right? So she said, Oh, <laughs> oh man, you look glorious today. Right? Just being sassy, just being, uh, you know, out of spirit, just being a devil, trying to, trying to. You know those type of women who will try to bring you down. That's what she's trying to do to David, right? David is in a great mood. He's having a great time. He knows that the Lord's dealing with him and his kingdom. But then he comes to his wife just trying to just, uh, just harshen the vibe, you know? Verse 21. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father, before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play to the Lord. Therefore, will I play before the Lord, excuse me. So, so David's like, look, you're just mad because your dad ain't king no more. But I'm your husband, and I'm king. Look what happened to your dad's house for being wicked. I'm here before the Lord. So, yeah, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to praise the Lord. As long as I'm doing what he wants me to do, I don't care what you got to say. All right, verse 22. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. All right, so all them kids David had, ain't none of them come from Saul's daughter. Ain't none of them come from who was supposed to be his first wife. Because she was being uh, petty. Now, was David a little petty too in doing that? You, you could say that. But hey, the Lord was dealing with him, though. And that's what matters. 